Hey, we're on our series called Journey of Hope, and uh, this is going to be our last installment of it, so uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope God's ministered to you. Get your sermon notes out. There's some there in your worship guide for you, or you can get on your YouVersion Bible app if you're more of a tech person and you get the sermon notes off of there. But we at the Rhodes Church, we believe that every time we open the Bible, God's speaking to us. He wants to speak to us. How many knows that God wants to speak to you more than you want him to speak to you? There's sometimes you're like, God, don't talk to me right now. I don't want to hear it. But he wants to speak to us. So that's why we get excited about the Bible, because we believe every time we open it up, God's got something to say. So let's open up our Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 12. Woo! We're usually a little more excited about the Bible than that, but I'll let you go. Genesis chapter 12. Okay, nice try. Too late. Too late. Bring it the first time, people. Genesis chapter 12. Uh, hey, here's our theme for today. Last week we talked about dwelling where you should have departed. Dwelling where you should have departed. Talked about getting out of Haran. Anybody leave Haran's this week? Get out of some situations, some habits, some thoughts. Well, this week we're going to talk about the theme for our journey of hope today is a question. The theme is, what are you looking at? So look at your neighbor and say, what are you looking at? <laughs> I... I I wonder, I wonder how many fights or arguments were started by that question right there. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? We're going to talk about what hope means and, and the purpose of uh, how, how our hope can impact our life. And I'll, I'll ask this. Have you ever tried to look away from something you know you shouldn't have been looking at? Maybe uh, th- there's, you know, there's things that are obviously visible. But just because it's visible, how many knows that doesn't mean we're supposed to look at it? You know, maybe, maybe you see somebody and uh, maybe how they're dressed, like they're looking, when you're like, you're trying not to look at it, you're trying, you know, we tell our kids, we teach them not to stare, you know, and they see something, they're just like, <laughs> you're like, or, or how about this, somebody comes up to you and say, and they say, hey, see that person over there? And you, don't look, don't look. I mean, you said, do you see them? And then you said, don't look. What's that mean? There's some things that we can see we're not supposed to look at. And that's what the theme is about. Sometimes in our life, for our hope to rise in our life, we got to be focused on what are we looking at. There's some things that we can see. There's lots of stuff we can see in our life, but not everything we can see we're supposed to get our attention on. You know, you look, I remember one time Lucas uh, was playing, and a friend of mine has a prosthetic leg. And I, I was watching him. He goes over to play by, by this friend of mine, and, and he, he catches out of his corner of his eye. He sees this leg, and, and, he, and I see him kind of looking out of the corner of his eye and kind of trying to turn. And, you know, he was only maybe, I don't know, three or four at the time, and he, he starts looking. But then he just is so captivated. He just, all just looking. <laughs> <laughs> totally out of So sometimes in your life, maybe there are things that you feel like, okay, should I look? Can I look? Is that a right to look? But our hope, what I believe and what I'm going to show you today, is that our hope can totally be attached by what we're looking at. What we're looking at can really impact our hope. So let's look at this in Genesis chapter 12. What we look at impacts the level of our hope. Genesis 12 says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. God speaking to Abram. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Father, I thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to bring life to it. I pray that you bring understanding and revelation to it. Lord, I pray that people will hear you and what you have to say to them, Lord. I pray that you will help us to look with hope at every circumstance in our life. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right, here we're talking about the life of Abraham, and I've given you three phases of hope uh, during our talks. During this series, we talked about the first one being the promise, and then we talked about the process, and then we talked about possession. And everybody likes the promise. We want to hear what God wants to do. The promises of God, yay, yay, yay. Now we got the process. That stinks sometimes, but then we want to possess it. So Today, I'm going to focus more on the process because, again, I want to help us get to where we're wanting to go, and and the process is usually where we struggle. The promise of God is awesome, 
that's great. Possessing the promise, that's great. The process is where we usually get stuck. So I, I want to talk about that a little bit. We see the promise here in verse 2. I'll make your name great. I'm sorry, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great. That was the promise. And the vision of the promise you know, gives us hope so that we can endure. But using the life of Abraham, I want to give you three things today about the process. Maybe a formula for walking out the process of hope in our life. The three L's. The three L's are this. Number one, leave. Number two is lift. And number three, <laughs> it's a good one, you got to look. So we got to leave, we got to lift, and we got to look. We're going to talk about all three of those out of the life of Abram. Lots of things could help us in our journey of hope, but these are three things. The first step is leave. Look at what he says in verse one. That We talked about this a little bit in departing last week, so I won't spend much time on it. The Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. The first step in walking in more hope in our life is we have to be willing to leave some things. Got to be willing to leave. Got to be willing to walk away from some stuff. He's telling him here, get out of your country, from your family, father's house, all this stuff. God's putting the cost. God likes to put the cost or the price up front in our life. So God tells us, let me give you an example. When Jesus called the 12 disciples, what did he say to them? If you're familiar with the New Testament, when Jesus went to call his disciples, he walked up to these people he had never met before, didn't have great relationship with them, walked up to them and said two words, just said, follow me. I'd be like, and? Follow me. Who are you? Follow me. So sometimes we got to be willing to leave some things in order to find out what comes next. We want to know what comes next before we leave. He just said, follow me. Jesus could have said, hey, you guys, come follow me. I'm the Messiah, the Son of God. Done some cool tricks or something. That would have been nice. And he said, if you'll follow me, you will have 12 thrones in heaven, and you'll rule with me. Okay, I'm down with that. But no, what did he say? Just follow me. This is why it's important. Sometimes God's going to ask us to leave something before he even tells us what we're going to. So can you trust God with leaving some things that you're familiar with? Leaving some things that you're comfortable with? Leaving some things that you've got accustomed to? Can you leave your justified feeling? That feeling that you're justified in feeling the way you do, can you leave that? Can you leave that unforgiveness that is justified in your heart? Can you leave that? Can you leave that insecurity that's justified because what people said or did to you? Can you leave those disappointments and hurts that's justified because what happened? Can you leave it and trust God with where he wants to take you? I'm telling you, for us to have hope in our life, sometimes we got to be willing to leave some stuff. And that is as hard as anything else. We get so comfortable in an area that God's saying, hey, I want you to leave that behind. I want you to leave that thought process behind. I want you to leave that hurt behind. I want you to leave that pain behind. Yeah, but, but where are we going to go? Just follow me. Just follow me. Where are we going, Lord? Just follow me. Yeah, but what is it going to be like if I follow you? Just follow me. Yeah, but what, what, what am I, what's going to, how's this going to end up? Just follow me. Leave it. So look at your neighbor and say, you got to leave. You got to leave. Like not right now, but you know, later you got to leave. So the first step, first step is are you willing to leave where you are and trust God where, you, where he wants to take you? Let's look at the second step. We saw Genesis 12. Let's go to Genesis 13. The second step is lift. We got to be able to leave something. Number two is lift. Genesis 13, verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, the Lord said to Abram, after. Everybody say, after. Now, notice something here. The Lord's speaking to Abram after Lot had separated him. Here's an important part of our journey of hope. This is the first time God had spoken to Abram since God said, get out of your country, get out of your family, and out of your father's house. And that happened way back in Ur before Haran, so Abram had not heard from God until now. Why so long? Here's what I believe is important for us to understand about God. I don't like it, but it's important for us to understand about God. God's not going to speak to us new instructions until we complete his previous instructions. Because what did he tell Abram to do? He said, get out of your country, 
Abram got out of his country, got out of Ur. He said, get out of your family. Eh, still got Lot with him. Get out of your father's house. He kept Terah until he died. So after Abram finally was separated, then God spoke. So I'm just asking you. I'm not trying to bring condemnation. What things has God asked you to do that you haven't done yet, and that's why you haven't heard anything new? We want God to speak to us and keep giving us. He's told us, hey, I need you to go do that. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. Then we don't do it. God, speak to me. Tell me what you want me to do. Uh, I already told you. Well, I know, but, but what else do you want me to do, God? I don't want to do that. I want you to call and ask them to forgive you. That's great. Lord, what else do you want me to do? Until you do what God's told you to do, he does not need to give us new instructions. All right, so, that's, so he spoke to Abram after Lot had separated him. What's the first thing he said? Finally, after all these years, literally years since God had spoke to him before, the first words from God to Abram after Lot had separated from him. Here it is, verse 14. Lift your eyes now. Lift your eyes now. Lift your eyes now. I'm like, what a, what a strange message to say after all these years why could it be because after all this time Abram had already started to get a little bit discouraged on what God had told him would happen I'm going to bless you I'm going to make your name great I will make you a great nation because how many of you have ever seen this maybe if you're involved in sports I'll oh, use a lot of sports analogies but it just works for me if it doesn't work for you I'm sorry but you ever see an athlete or a player that when they're not doing good when they're struggling what happens to their head what do we say to a team that's getting their tails handed to them? They're getting beat, and they're all down there, and they look like this. Their heads are down. What do we yell out? We say, get your head up. Why? Yeah, I don't know what you say. Maybe I shouldn't have left that as a fill-in-the-blank statement. Maybe. <laughs> that was dangerous. <laughs> that's good. I don't know what you yell, but here's what you're supposed to yell, and then I'll give you the cue. That was, good. That was funny. So anyway, <laughs> Whew, I got a lot of thoughts running around the track right now. Man, this is awesome, talking live to people online. So anyway, back to the message. We say, get your heads up. That's what most people say. Get your head up. Why? And I see this either myself, you're like, like I was playing football and I, when I played quarterback position, there's one thing, there's some things great about playing that position, some things not so great. Because if you're out there and you throw a touchdown, it's awesome. You throw an interception, it's not awesome. I don't know if you know anything about football, but when you throw it to the other team, that's not a good thing. So if I would, if I would throw a pass and it get intercepted and I got to come off the field, most of the time you see people that come off the field in that situation, my head's down. I'm little, I, don't, I don't want anybody to see me. I don't think, if I'm, maybe I'm pretending nobody can see me, but I'm discouraged, something like that. But if I threw a pass and it was a touchdown, hey, hey, my head's up. I'm looking for people to give me a high five. Hey, hey, what's up? And this is what he's saying to Abram. Hey, lift your eyes. Get your head up. If we're going to walk in hope, the first thing we got to do is quit just staring at what's going on in our immediate surroundings and lift our eyes to see what God wants to do in our life. Get your head up. Get encouraged. He doesn't say be happy about what's going on around you. He says get your eyes up and see something else rather than what's going on around you. Here's what it says in Psalms 121. He says, I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Lifting is about getting to a higher level or position. When he says, hey, Abram, lift your eyes. In other words, get a higher perspective. And this is what God's speaking to you and I. If you're going through something now and it feels hopeless, get your eyes up. We can get so focused on what's going around us that our eyes, all we see is this. He says, get your eyes up. Get a different perspective. Look at your neighbor. Say, look up. Look up. It's time to lift your eyes. Lift your eyes. Notice what he says. Now let's go back to that verse 14. Genesis 13, 14. And the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes when? Lift your eyes when? Lift your eyes when you feel better. Lift your eyes when circumstances give you permission to do so. Lift your eyes when? Now. Lift your eyes when things work out and you understand how it's going to be. No. Lift your eyes. Come on, people. You got to lift your eyes now. 
This is when hope is going to rise in our life, when we lift our eyes, not when we're waiting for something external to change, but internally we say, I'm going to lift my eyes. So it's an internal decision, not an external motivation. This is really important. We're not always going to feel motivated externally to do what God's asking us to do. So the difference for us being filled with hope is when we can do it based on an internal decision and not an external motivation. It's great to have people in your corner rah-rah on you and telling you, come on, get your head up, you can do it, come on champ. It's great to have all that, but what if you don't have anybody? What if nobody's in your corner? What if nobody's telling you to get your head up? What are we going to do then? Something inside of you has to say, I'm going to lift my eyes to the hills where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. When I don't see help anywhere else. So number one, we got to lift our eyes. Or number two, lift our eyes now. Here's, here's the third step. So second, first step is we've got to leave some things. Number two, we've got to lift your eyes to see from God's perspective. Number three, look at verse 14. He said, separated from him, lift your eyes now and look. Here's the third step. You've got to look. Look from the place where you are. Look from the place where you are. I'm going to break this down for you. Where we look from matters. Notice what he said to Abram. If you're going to have hope in your life, look from the place where you are. The word from is a word definition, but according to Webster, it's a function word that means to indicate a starting point of a physical movement. Let's say it again. Starting point of a physical movement. So from where we are is our starting point of hope. Here's what he's saying to Abram. Hey, lift your eyes and look from where you are now. From where you are now. In other words, our hope in our life starts from where we are, not where we want to be, not where we wish we were. It starts right now. I got to begin to be filled with hope. I got to look from where I am with hope, not where I want to be, not when I get there, then now I can have hope, or when this changes or that. From where you are now, we need to let hope start to arise. We need to look at our perspective from where we are and let hope arise from that. Our, where's our starting point for hope? It's where we are now. You don't understand where I am. I chat, I'm in, I'm in a bad place. When I get, here's what I hear. Hey, chat, when I get some stuff figured out, when I get some stuff straightened out, then I'll start coming to church and then we'll get this thing going. I'm telling you, we'll, we'll be popping, baby. But I, I got to come. It's, I got to get some stuff. I got to get some stuff together. You know, I got some stuff going on. And, and from, no, our starting point is from where you are now. From where we are now. From where you are in your marriage now. That's the starting point. I didn't say it was the finishing point. That's the starting point. From where you are with that relationship, wherever you are. That's, he says, look up from where you are now. And this is what he's saying to Abram. Let hope arise from where you are, not where you want to be, not where you wish we were. We have to start somewhere from our pain, from our insecurity, from my current state of disappointment, from my current state of frustration, from here. Can I see from here? Can you look from here? If we, if we, don't, see, if we don't look from where we are, we're never going to get where we need to be. Look what he says. Look from the place where you are now. Northward, he gives them direction. Look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. Notice what he says. Look from where you are now, Abram. Look from where you are now, and I want you to look north, south, east, and west. Look all around you. He says, what do you see? What do you see all around you? Here's what I've, I've learned in my life. Jot this down. Note takers are world changers. In your life, you're going to have two things surrounding you all the time. Problems and possibilities. They're always going to surround you. The difference is which ones are you going to look at. We're going to have opposition and we're going to have opportunities. Which ones are you going to look at? I'm going to either see. He was telling Abraham, he said, look all around you, north, south, east, west, all around you. He was saying, I'm surrounding you with possibilities. Everything that you see, I'm going to give to you. So can you see your life changing? If you can't see it in your heart, you're not going to see it in the natural. If you can't see yourself changing, if you can't see yourself and your life acting a different way, if you can't see things happening in your heart by faith, you're never going to see it with your eyes. Well, as far as you can see, Abram, I'm going to give it to you. 
Look around you. Do you see opportunities around you? Or do you see the same junk day after day after day after day? I'm surrounded by discouragement, by depression, by disappointment, by this, by that frustration, by that. Do I see it? He said, look around you, north, south, east, and west. I've surrounded you with opportunities. I've, seen, I've surrounded you with possibilities. So he said, but can you see it? Can you see it? How many of you guys have ever said this to someone? I just can't see that happening. I just can't see it happening. That's cool, Chad. That's cool. That's nice. That sounds good. I just don't see it. I just can't see it. I understand. I can't see some things either with these little peepers. Can't see them with that. But you got to see it here. God's saying if you can see it in your heart, if you can see the possibilities and, and lift your eyes to him where your help comes from, now you can begin to see breakthroughs. So this is what God is saying to us. We got to see it from his perspective. So now let's look what he says in verse 16. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants would also be numbered. Whoa, he's talking about a lot of kids and Abram doesn't even have one. Are you listening? He just told Abram, uh, your, your descendants, all your kids, it's going to be like the dust of the earth. How many knows there's a lot of dust in the Middle East? A lot of dust. He said, that's, if you can number the dust of the earth, that's how many your kids are going to be. So look what he says in verse 17. With that, with that crazy, out-of-the-box, wild thought that makes no sense, that's absolutely impossible that God just said to him in verse 17. Now he has the audacity to say, arise and walk in the land through its length and its width, and I give it to you. In other words, get up from where you are and start walking in what I just said. What I just told you, get up, arise, arise, get up, don't stay where you are. In other words, we have to move into what God calls us into. We want God to drag us. He says, arise and start walking in it. Arise, get up, get up. Get up from where you are. Get up out of that situation and start walking in what I just told you. But what you just told me makes no sense. I know. Start walking in it. Arise and start walking. You're going to have descendants as the dust of the earth. What? That's impossible. I know. Start walking in it. God is actually asking you and I to arise and start walking in impossibilities. How can we do that? We can only do it because he is the one who's going to meet those needs and not us. It says, arise and start walking in what I just told you. So now, that's where we, where we look from matters. Now let's look at where we look to matters. If where we look from matters, from where we are, let's look at look to. Go to Genesis chapter 15, where we look to matters. If we're going to get hope in our life, where we look to matters. Genesis 15, look at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, <laughs> Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? <laughs> Has anybody ever talked to God with a little bit of frustration? I know most of you are very super religious people and would never do that. But sometimes some people might get a little frustrated with God and might talk to him like they're a little bit short. They're a little bit frustrated with God. And I, I felt like this is, what, this is the context of what I'm picking up and what Abram's throwing down here. I'm, I feel this tone coming from Abram. He said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless. Remember that dust of the earth thing you just mentioned a chapter ago? Well, seeing, seeing, seeing what I see, I go childless, even though you said, I see, I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus, some servant that lives in my house. Then Abram said, <laughs> look what he said, then Abram said to God, he says, look, he, so Abram's saying to God, telling God, look, look down, he says, look. You have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is, is my heir. So Abram's saying, God, look at my situation. Has anybody ever felt like God's not looking at you? 
You ever felt like God's done, not paying attention to what's going on in your house? Look at me. Look at all this. Look at what's going on. You, no, you look, look right here. It's like, God, you're, you're not looking. You're not paying attention. So everything in this situation is about, God, you look at me. You're dropping the ball. I'm fine. I'm praying. Oh, nobody ever felt like that. Okay, okay, okay. Nobody, nobody a little afraid or something. So we got to be real. God, how come you're not looking at me? You're not seeing me. I'm fine. Why aren't you doing your job? He's saying, look. Look, you, you've given me no offspring. You said I was going to have descendants like the dust of the earth. But I got none. And I got one, one servant. And that one is going to be the heir. And look what God's. I love God. He's so good. How many is thankful that God's mercy endures forever? He's so patient with us. Oh. You know, look what he says to Abram. You know, if, if I was God, I'd probably done lit Abram up with a lightning bolt or something right now. But he, but he's so, he's so good. He said, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside. God brought Abram outside and said, what did he say to him? Follow along. What did he say? He said, Look, are you still, are you, do you have your Bibles with the screen? He said, what did he say? He said, look, look now towards heaven. So here, Abram was, God, you look. Look at what's happening. I got one. My hope is in this one. It's not even mine. My situation. Look at what's going on. Look what's not happening. Look what you're not doing. Look what's not coming to pass like you said it was. Look at this. And God said, no, you look at me. Abram's trying to get God to look at his situation, and God's trying to get Abram to look at him. He says, look now towards heaven. Look now towards heaven. And he says, <laughs> and count the stars if you're able to number them, smarty pants. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted him for righteousness. The second part of where we look that's important, where we look to matters. If all we can look to is what's not happening or what God's not doing, we're never going to look up to the possibilities of what he can do. Abram was so focused on his one, he couldn't see the multiple. God said, hey, look at these stars. I know you haven't been able to create a child. I know you've been trying, and I know it hasn't worked yet. I know that that's got you discouraged, and you've got a servant, and you're trying to make that work. But I know that's not working. But look, look up here. Look at me. Look what I made. Look at my creation. Start, go ahead and count the stars. Go ahead, just count them. One, two. I'm just kidding. As a hypothetical. But he's, he's saying, count. He's saying, look what I made. If I can make all these stars, what can I do for you? Where we look to matters. We don't, if our hope is going to rise, it's not going to be by looking at our situation more. It's going to be looking at what God can do. So maybe you're asking yourself, are my eyes on the wrong thing? Do I need to look to myself or am I looking to God? Where we look to matters. And then lastly, let's go to Romans chapter 4. How we look matters. Where we look from matters. Where we look to matters. And then lastly, how we look matters. This is our formula for hope, Romans chapter 4. I'm going to start reading in verse 13. This is the New Testament version of what we talked about there in Genesis chapter 12, the life of Abram. I want you to see something about hope rising in Abram's life. Verse 13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs... Faith is made void, and the promise of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. Verse 16, therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, this is God speaking to Abram, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of him who believed God, who gives life to the dead. Anybody have any dead situations that need to be brought to life? 
You got something that you're like, okay, that's over. It can't, it can't be changed. It can't be brought around. This is what God does. He gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. This is God's job. He calls something differently than what we see it, how we feel it, how we hear it. He calls those things that do not exist as though they did. Verse 18, this is Abraham's side now. Who contrary to hope, in hope believed. Now the word contrary means totally opposite of hope. In other words, he's in a position of lack of hope. So if this is hope over here, here's Abram over here. I'm contrary to hope. I'm against hope. I'm opposite of hope. Whatever hope is, I'm the opposite. That's where Abram was. But it says in this position, contrary to hope, in hope believed. Here's what God's saying. How we believe matters. Look what it says. How did he do this? How could he believe? How could he believe in hope when he was in the middle of hopelessness? Look at this verse. This is so important. Catch this. So that he became the father of many nations according to what was. Let me try it again. I want to make sure you get it. So that he became the father of many nations according to what was. I'm going to try it one more time. I don't think they quite got it yet. So that he, Abraham, became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. Thank you. You're, you're getting that. Notice what happened. How did he become the father of many nations? How did hope rise in his life? According to what was seen. According to how he felt. According to what he heard. According to what was how we look matters. Let me help you. I'm going to help myself. Hope is going to rise in my life when I look at situations not according to what I see, but according to what was spoken. Are you looking at your situation according to what was spoken by God or according to what you see? He became the father of many nations not because what he saw, because what he saw was hopeless. I'm 90 years old. By the time he had 99 years old, and I cannot have a baby. According to what he saw, he was never going to become the father of many nations. According to what you see right now, some of you are never going to see change in your life. According to what you see. But thank God it's not according to what we see, it's according to what was said. So how we look matters. Am I looking according to what God spoke over my life or am I looking according to what I see? Jesus gave us this model on how to defeat the enemy. You know when the enemy came and tempted Jesus in the desert, right? He came to him and the Father, this was right after Jesus had been water baptized and, and the Holy Spirit came on Jesus and, and the, the word of uh, word of God came from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He spoke that over him. He spoke that. This is my beloved son. He spoke it. Catch this. Don't, don't check out yet. People are going to positions and, and to serve, and mission, but don't check out yet. According to what was spoken, what was spoken to Jesus? You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Then, Luke chapter 4, the Spirit takes Jesus into a wilderness season. Anybody ever been in a wilderness season? Thank you. In a wilderness season, what happened? All of a sudden, 40 days, no food, no water, no word from God. No voice from God. God's not speaking to Jesus. We don't have any record of it. We don't have any record where Jesus is speaking to him. And during that time, who's the only voice that comes to Jesus? It's the enemy. And what's the enemy say? He says, if you are the Son of God, if you are, if you are, do something. If you are, you're hungry, do this. Everything, hey, look at this. Look at all these kingdoms of the earth. Brings him up on the temple. Everything was about what he could see in this realm. And the temptation of Jesus was, is to operate according to what you see. But what was Jesus' response every time? It is, it is, it is written. See, he was saying, devil, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved according to what was spoken over my life. 
And my father said, I'm his beloved son and who I'm well pleased. So my hope is filled in my heart, not because what I see. I don't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of my father. God's saying to you, your hope matters based on how you look at things. Are you looking according to what you see? Or are you looking according to what was said? What has God spoken over your situation? Well, I don't know. Then you need to find out. We need to find out. I need to know the word of the Lord over my marriage. I need to know the word of the Lord over my situation. What has God spoken? Because I don't want to look according to what I see. I want to look according to what was spoken. My hope will never rise as long as I look according to what I see. I'll be like, nope, still not changing. I prayed yesterday for Pete's sake. It's been 24 hours. Look, look, God. Look what's not changing. Look what you're not doing. Look what's still the same. Anybody ever prayed like that? Maybe it's just me. That's all right. Pray for me. But instead of us looking down, God's saying to you and I, hey, three things to fill your hope tank this morning. Number one, there's some things you need to leave. Leave that hurt. Leave that unforgiveness. Leave that disappointment. you got to leave it. I don't want to leave it. I can't leave it. I don't know how much. I know it's hard. But we've got to leave it. Why? Because i got to trust what I'm going to is bigger than what I'm leaving behind. Got to leave it. And then i got to lift my eyes. i got to stop looking at what's around. i got to lift my eyes where my help comes from. I see you, Jesus. And then i got to look from where I am. It's not where I want to be. But I'm looking from where I am to where God wants to take me. Thanks so much for watching with us. We love our online family and we invite you to connect with us. We have a few different ways you can do that on our website at theroads.church as well as on social media. You can text to give by texting the amount space roads to 45777. And we'd love to pray for any needs you might have. So send us a message and let us know how we can partner with you in bringing the light and love of Jesus to your world.